Welcome to this week's message from Cross Life Church. I'm Andrew Portnoy. When do you take down your Christmas decorations? I know. Right now it's March, and if you haven't yet taken down the Christmas lights in your house, your HOA has probably reminded you. Today we are studying one of the names of Jesus, Emmanuel. We sing about that name at Christmas, but the meaning of the name is not limited to Christmas at all. It means God with us. When do you want Jesus with you? December and January only? And what does it mean that Jesus is with you now, no matter what month it is, and that He will be with you forever? Celebrate a tiny slice of Christmas and let it inspire you to keep Christmas as part of your faith journey the entire year. Here's Pastor Darren. So I have this weird question, and uh, uh, you're going to think it's weird because of the timing, but here's my question. When do you take your Christmas decorations down? See, I told you, it's a weird question. I mean, if I were to ask you that in February, maybe, or late January, okay, you'd understand that question. But it's, our, it's March already. I mean, who, who keeps their Christmas decorations, decorations up until, until March? I mean, if you have your Christmas lights uh, outside your house yet, your HOA has probably gently reminded you that they need to come down. So why am I asking you that question? I'm asking that question because we are opening a new series today called The Greatest Name. And we are rejoicing in the names of Jesus. And the name of Jesus we rejoice in today is Emmanuel. Ah, see that? And you typically hear the name Emmanuel for Jesus at Christmas time. It's part of the Christmas prophecy. I'll get to that in a little bit. But that name Emmanuel means God with us. So, here's a follow-up question. Okay, so Emmanuel, a name for Jesus, means God with us. When do you want Jesus with you? Only in December and maybe into January? And what difference does it make that Jesus is with you now? I mean, no matter what month it is, and will be with you forever. So we're celebrating a tiny slice of Christmas today. It's awesome. And uh, it's inspiring us to keep Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, as part of our faith the entire year. So I'm going to bring you now this true story in the Bible of, about Jesus as an adult. And uh, actually, uh, later in his ministry, much later, we're going to study this Bible teaching today that shows us Jesus um, betrayed and arrested and that story is going to show us how Jesus is God with us. And I'll read that story in about, in about seven minutes. And when I read it, you're going to think, this doesn't look like Christmas at all, that, like that first Christmas. But if you say that, you really haven't taken a deep dive into what the Bible does say about that very first Christmas. Because the very first Christmas was not glorious and cozy at all like our romantic ideas of Christmas, surrounded by family in front of a fireplace, opening beautifully wrapped gifts with the perfect foods. I mean, the Bible says that Mary and Joseph, that first Christmas, Jesus' birth, they were separated from their families. They traveled 75 miles on foot from their town to a dirty little town called Bethlehem, summoned there by the Roman government. They had to sleep with animals and share the birth of Jesus with stinky shepherds. And then lying in a manger with straw sticking to him from animal saliva and some slimy birth fluid, <laughs> Jesus didn't look like God at all. He looked like any other baby. But then as he grew up, and especially in his adult years, as he, as he be, after he was baptized by John uh, as an adult, and then those, uh, his early 30s, Jesus was revealing himself more and more to people as the Son of God, as true God, by doing miracles, by his teaching, by saying that he and the Father were one. And so eventually, more and more, Jesus revealed that he's true God. Now, that's very important. It's very essential for salvation. It's important that, that your Savior is completely God in every way, and that your Savior is completely man in every way, just like Jesus is. So let me give you a few examples about why that's important. And by the way, we call this teaching, the Jesus is true man and true God at the same time. 
We call that his dual nature, true man, a, a human nature, a divine nature. So as God, Jesus is, gave all the laws. He stands above the law and he, he gives the law. As man, Jesus, as a human, was submitted to the law. He had to obey the law, God's law, as much as you and I do. As Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, God who made the law, man who kept the law, he, he kept the law perfectly in every way, and as God, he now applies that as a credit to you, keeping the law in every way. That's why your Savior needs to be both God and man, Emmanuel, God with us. Or another example, as God, Jesus cannot die. He's immortal. But as man, he came so that he could die. Now, what does that mean? That means that as Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus died, and because of his death, being, being God, his holy, innocent, perfect blood, is the payment for all the sins of the entire world. And so, to be a true Savior, I'm going to tell you this, a true Savior is more than a man. He is God. Do not look to anyone to save you or any religion to save you unless the Savior of that religion is more than just a man, unless he is God. And a true Savior is more than God. He is a man. He must be a man. So a true Savior truly saves you without asking you to do any of it yourself. That's, that's what a true Savior does, and that's what Jesus does. Now, so Jesus is your Savior, but do you really need saving? I mean, after all, you're a pretty good person. Here you are watching this, this video, maybe attending online church. You're doing more than a lot of other people in this world by, by watching this right now. So do you really need saving? Well, let me ask you this. Do you, have you ever been disappointed about church? Have you ever felt emotional pain in family relationships? Has someone who you thought was your friend turned their back on you? Have you ever been forced by the government to do something against your will that you feel is unfair or just doesn't make sense? Have you ever been mocked for your faith? Have you ever served God? You're surrendering to God, you're yielding to him, and as you're doing God's will, you're experiencing suffering and discomfort and inconvenience and pain. Right? You you must experience all those things, but not alone. God gave you others to experience that with you. And then here is what you and I do in our frailed our frail thinking, our flawed humanity. We think that we we should experience those alone. We think that we don't need any help. We, we think that we don't need saving. We might pretend that those things aren't really impacting us when they are. We try to control them in our own ways. No, thank you, Jesus. What you're going to see today in this true story of Jesus is that Jesus experienced every one of those things I just said. And it's very important that he experienced them in every real way, just like you do, as a person. And when he experienced them, he overcame them because he was looking to his Father, as you and I should look to Jesus. And it's important that he experienced them so that when you experience them again and again, and you will, that you know he is, he, the one who has experienced those things, is there and, and he's with you. So, Here's the reality. Jesus does experience those things. As a matter of fact, he told his followers once to expect it. He said, I must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. So as God of the universe, who created all things and controls them however he wishes, Jesus gave up control. Jesus experienced suffering and death in all his humanness. And so he saved you from thinking you don't need him, don't need salvation, don't need God. Jesus became Emmanuel, God with us, so that you have a Savior who really can, in a real way, take away your guilt and shame, a Savior whose love and faithfulness are stronger 
always stronger than any of your pain, any of your disappointment. He understands when hopes are dashed, when disappointment comes. He's a savior, and he must, see Jesus' words there, he must let himself be mocked as long as he was surrendering to the will of God. So Jesus experienced all those things. And now when you experience them, disappointment about church, right? This, the verse that I read talked about the chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law. These are the church leaders who don't get it right. And I know people experience that in their churches, even in our church today. The church doesn't always get it right. And the emotional pain of family, the, the emotional pain that Jesus was experiencing, being, suffering while his own mother, Mary, was watching. And nobody knows where his earthly father, Joseph, is at this time. If Joseph had died when Jesus was young, if, if Joseph had abandoned was somewhere else, the, we don't know. Emotional pain of family. Friends, turning her back on you, one of Jesus' own 12 disciples, Judas, betrayed him, set him up so that Jesus would be in the Garden of Gethsemane at this moment, and Judas was going to bring the soldiers, and he did, to arrest Jesus. Even the faithful rest of the 12 ran away and hid because they were scared. They didn't stay by Jesus' side. A government forcing you to do and to act in ways that you don't want to do or act during the COVID pandemic or paying your taxes. He, Jesus experienced the government telling him what to do when Pontius Pilate said he must be crucified and when these soldiers showed up and they arrested him. Being mocked for your faith, ridiculed, that happens to Christians, it happened to Jesus. Surrendering to God's will, doing what God wanted. When, when you and I seek to live as Christians, as followers of Jesus, and it doesn't go the way that we want, and not, everything is not perfect. It's like Jesus' disciples on the Sea of Galilee sailing and fishing where he tells them to sail and where he tells them to fish, and they experience hardship. They, God, are you here? Is Jesus really with us? Let me read to you this story from John chapter 18. And when I read it, this is Jesus, again, um, this is just before he dies, when he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as I read it, you try to identify where, where in this true story it tells us that Jesus is God. John chapter 18, beginning at verse 3. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Who do you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him. It was about 700 years before this happened that God, through the prophet Isaiah, predicted and prophesied in these words, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Some months before Jesus' birth, the angel repeated those very words to Joseph. Emmanuel, 
and, and explain a name in Hebrew language means very simply God with us. God is here, one of us. At the same time, he's also God who fills the universe from eternity to eternity. Now, he doesn't always seem like he's God here in your life. I get that. But I want you to take notes about three things that, that happened in the story that I just read. Take notes about these. So, number one, the Bible says that Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane knowing all that was going to happen to him, and yet he does it anyway. Jesus knows he's going to suffer. He knows it, it will be painful and, and uncomfortable and even death. He knows all that as God, and yet as man, he says, oh, I can do this. Just like on the cross, Jesus knew. He, Jesus knew that you and I, there would be times in our lives as believers where we're not perfectly faithful. There's times in our lives as believers we sin. There's times in the history and the future of this world where the world condemns Jesus, doesn't see him as God, and yet Jesus was willing to die for all of it and all of us anyway. Number two, that that servant and soldier, Malchus, holding his, in his hand a bloody ear sliced off by the sword of Peter. What is he thinking about Jesus at this moment as Jesus takes his ear and, and seals it back on Malchus's head? He has to be thinking that this man, this is God and he is here. And finally, the soldiers in the story, as Jesus as, you know, they come to grab Jesus. They're carrying lanterns to look in every dark corner of the Garden of Gethsemane. They're carrying weapons as if they could fight God. And when they say they're looking for Jesus, Jesus says, I, I'm the man. And they, they fall backwards. They faint. they almost like dead men, the Bible says. Then as they're getting up to their feet, they have to be wondering, what is happening? And is this God? And is he here? You know the answer. Yes, Jesus is God. Yes, he is here. He's here all the time. Jesus is really with us. He's invisible to our human eyes, and he's everywhere at the same time, just like he said, I am with you always, when he made that promise in Matthew chapter 28. Now, let me answer some really difficult questions as I wrap this up. If Jesus is truly Emmanuel, God with us, and we say that he's here, even though we can't see him, he's here, he's everywhere. It, it can seem right now like Jesus is not really in Ukraine. And it can seem right now like Jesus is not really in the dirty van of the pedophile who is destroying children and families the wickedness and evil of our world. Where is God? It can seem like Jesus is not in the, the accountant's office, uh, the pediatrician's office, the doctor's office. It, it seem, when the bad news comes, it can seem like Jesus isn't there. It can seem like Jesus is not in the, in the bedroom of your child who is crying so much because they're scared to go to sleep. Where is Jesus? I have an answer to all of those. I have an answer to that concern, and it's a good concern, and it's a good question. Listen again to the final words in the story where Jesus asks, Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers arrested Jesus. They bound him. How can it be? How can God's hands be tied how strong those ropes must be. Strong like a Russian invasion. Strong like COVID. Strong like fears. How strong those ropes must be. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Jesus is God. He is much stronger. He is with us. He is there. And he believes what you and I need to believe right now. He believes his Father has given. See that word there? Father has given this to him. God gives you, gives our world, gives the church what we experience in suffering and sadness. God gives that to us 
and it's ours, gives it to you, to me. Then Jesus also knows that his father is in charge, is truly in charge of the soldiers. Even today, as Jesus is still in charge of governments, of dementia, of autism, of interest rates, of tax brackets, he is God, and he is here. He is here with you, and he is here for you. So commit to him more courageously, because Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus is God, and he is here. Follow him more faithfully, because Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus is God, and Jesus is here. Love others more loyally, because Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus is God. Jesus is here. So I want you to do something this week. I want you to say those words. I want you to, to repeat those words. As a matter of fact, say, say them after I say them right now. Jesus is God. And he is here. Repeat those words this week. When you are encountering problems, difficulties, disappointments, shame of sin, worries about the future. And as a matter of fact, why don't you Google uh, a Christmas song that has the word Emmanuel in it, the name Emmanuel, and listen to that song this week, say those words over and over, and see what God can do. Amen. Please pray with me. Jesus, you are God and you are here. We trust in you, we believe in you, Jesus, that you truly are, are completely divine. You are God in every way. And we love, Jesus, that you are a human in every way too, just like us, experiencing troubles, difficulties, hardships, suffering, even death. Jesus, send your spirit to teach us today from this Bible section to increase our faith and enrich our following of you that that we always believe in any circumstances, Jesus, that you are and remain God and you never quit on us, you never give up on us, and you are here, you are with us. Jesus, I pray that if there's someone right now joining me in this prayer who doesn't yet believe in you, that because of these promises, because of these powerful truths, that they believe in you now, and they, that they connect with us here at Cross Life Church, that we might walk with them in their new faith and their journey. Bless us during the season of Lent, Lord Jesus, as we follow you to the cross, as we rejoice in your love for us, and as we commit that love to others. In your name we pray, amen. Do you want to get to know Cross Life, our story, and our mission? Follow us on Facebook at Cross Life PF Church. There you'll also find prayer memes and daily blogs and God's Word for your quiet time with God. I'm Andrew Portnoy, and from all of us here at Cross Life, thank you for tuning in, and see you next week.